Hold me a little closer Take me a little deeper Wanna know you Wanna know you Cause your love is so much sweeter Than anything I've tasted is so much sweeter than anything I've tasted. Welcome back to day two of Passover to Resurrection. So just a reminder, as we go through these days, Thursday of the Lord's Supper to now Friday and then to Holy Saturday and finally to Easter Sunday, we're journeying from the mystery of the Passover to the resurrection. So the, the mystery of the Passover permeates this whole story, but also the, the light and the, and the power and the love of the resurrection permeates this whole story. So from Passover, in order to understand our redemption in Christ Jesus, we need to first understand Israel's first redemption from slavery to Egypt, which was commemorated in that Seder meal and that Passover meal. Well, last night we, we dove into that mystery of, of the Passover meal. And today we come to the mystery of the cross. And as we move from the mystery of the supper to the mystery of the, of the cross, we're moving closer to the resurrection. I think it's important to realize though, and I just underline it one more time, that the power and the light and the love of the resurrection permeates this whole mystery. And Matthew puts this on display fantastically in reminding us that when Jesus died on the cross, that the ground shook and Luke tells us that the sun went into eclipse and darkness covered the land. But Matthew tells us that the graves were opened and many saints were raised from the dead and they were walking about the holy city. So just as a sign that we don't forget that even in Jesus' death, resurrection power is, is released, is flowing, is present. So that could be a word for us if there's any place where we're experiencing a crucifixion in our life to know as sure as we can be sure with the, the certainty of, of the Father's love for us. And he proved his certainty by showing that he's, there's nothing that he wasn't willing to do by, by sending his son. We can know that whatever cross we go through, the power of the resurrection is there, resurrection is there ready for us to touch it and experience that power flow. Okay, so but where I want to dive into is one of the readings 
for this day is Hebrews. And so if you, if you have your, your Bible there, your Bible apps, and you want to follow it, I put a few verses of it here up on the screen for us. But Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 to 16. The book of Hebrews is a, is a magnificently mysterious book. And one of the most mysterious dimensions of Jesus' identity is spoken about in the fullest way in this book. And that's the mystery of Jesus' identity as Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek is very infrequently spoken about in the Bible. The first time he shows up, it's in the, it's in the book of Genesis. I believe it's chapter 14. Abraham has an encounter with Melchizedek. But then Melchizedek disappears and doesn't reappear until Psalms, Psalms 110. And then David has an encounter with Melchizedek. While, they're, while Melchizedek is only mentioned twice in the Old Testament, here in the book of Hebrews, when you get to the center chapter of the book of Hebrews, you have line after line after line about Melchizedek as the high priest to understand Jesus' own high priesthood. So Melchizedek, the words itself, well, he's described as Melchizedek, the king of Salem. King of Salem, Salem means peace, so... He's the king of peace. Melchizedek is the king of peace. But also his name reveals that he's the king of something else. Melech means king and Zedek means righteous. So Melchizedek is the king of righteousness, the king of peace. And I'm proposing that this is a secret dimension of who Jesus is and Jesus' own priesthood as the king of kings. He's the king of righteousness and he's the king of peace. But so here we are in this mysterious book, the book of Hebrews. And let's read some of, the, some of the lines that we have to meditate on for today in the midst of the crucifixion, the, the darkest day in the history. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. All right, I'm going to pause there for a moment. Just highlight that line, ascended into heaven. So remember, this is the day just a few moments ago when the good thief said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did Jesus say? This day you will be with me in paradise. So I think that's a marvelous pattern for us to lay hold of, as it says here, lay hold of firmly to the faith we profess, to lay hold of firmly on this good thief's worst day, the day of his capital punishment, the day of his execution. What does Jesus say to him? Today, you'll be with me in paradise. This also tests the bounds of our understanding of time and eternity because we know also Jesus is going to be laid in the tomb and he's going to descend into hell and he's going to rise on the third day. But he tells this good thief, today I'm going to be with you in paradise. So this is what you can do when you're in that, in that eternal realm. So yeah, so there's, there's an ascension. There's, there's this message of ascension that's present already on the cross, right in the midst of the cross. So let's move on to the next line. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let me pause there and focus on the line weakness. So with this ascension lifestyle that we're being invited to, What an awesome proposal that we have access to the very throne of God. Are you aware of the ways in which within ourselves, though, that we disqualify ourselves again and again? We come up with reasons why this isn't for us or this isn't for us now. But I love the author of the Hebrews' clarity 
We do not have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weakness. He says, I know you feel weak. I know you feel unworthy. But we have a high priest who understands this and is offering the power of the ascended lifestyle to you even still, just as he offered it to the good thief. This day, you will be with me in paradise. Okay, so he can empathize with our weakness. But we have one who's been tempted in every way as we are, yet he didn't sin. So here's that tension. Tempted in every way, yet he did not sin. To fully appreciate this, let's finish the final verse and then reflect back on. Tempted in every way, yet he did not sin. Okay, let us, so here's the final line. Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence. This is what I'm really anchoring on today, on Good Friday. That today is the day that we approach God's throne, throne of grace with confidence. I love the word confidence. I, I often talk about having unshakable confidence. Confidence means with faith. C-O-N is from the Latin with, and fide is Latin for faith. So the word confidence, far from being arrogance or presumption, confidence is to live with faith. And an unshakable faith, an unshakable confidence, is one that's gone through the testing. So it's the unsha- what's unshakable about it is actually pure humility because you've been shaken and all that can be shaken away has been shaken away and only that which is unshakable remains. Let us approach God's throne of grace. So I'm proposing to you, brothers and sisters, that the cross is an invitation to access a heavenly realm. Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence. And it's that throne of grace by which, well, it's, it's that power of grace by which we can follow Christ. It says, he was tempted in every way, yet he did not sin. Now, theologically, there's different ways to frame this. And there's one way that most recently, in the last couple of years, has really moved me. And that's when St. Paul says, Jesus was in the, though Jesus was in the form of God, he did not deem with equality with God something to be grasped at. That what Jesus puts on display as he walks in his humanity is that he has pressed pause on his access to what would be available in his divinity. And he's giving us an example of what we can do under the power of the Holy Spirit. So remember, Jesus' public ministry begins with the baptism. We have the open heavens and the dove descends, uh, the Holy Spirit descends in the form of the dove and rests upon him. And perhaps this is the first time that you've thought about it like this. If it is, I say, give it some time. Give it some consideration. Um, The more time I've given it, the more I've been convicted by it. Everything that Jesus did He was relying on the power of the Holy Spirit rather than appealing to his divinity. And think about it. If he was accessing his divinity, how could he be a model for us? Um, And that's one of the reasons that, that he comes, is to be an example for us. All right, so let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. We're being invited at the cross with the high priest, who's both priest and victim, We're being invited to gain access to this heavenly realm so that we may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. All right, so this is is our verse for meditation today. And in this meditation, I want to uh, focus on, as we've already been highlighting, this, the ascended lifestyle enjoys the fruit of a future age. I don't know if you heard that hammering, but there's a little meditation on the crucifixion there. <laughs> um, so in this ascended lifestyle, 
that we can enjoy the fruit of a future age. And one of the figures that puts this on display in the scriptures the most vibrantly is King David. And so I highlighted three Psalms, Psalm 22, Psalm 23, and Psalm 24. And I'd like to refer to those Psalms as Psalm 23 is probably the well, most well-known Psalm, which you already know, the Lord is my shepherd. Um, so, so if you have that Psalm in your pocket already, I'm inviting you to tuck in to the pocket also 22, the Psalm before and 24, the Psalm after. And I'm com- I, have a, I have a conviction that I can frame them in such a way that you'll never forget them, okay? So I'd like to propose that 22 represents every knee bending under the earth, 23 represents every knee bending on the earth, and 24 represents every knee bending in the heavens. Okay, so under, on, and above, or under, on, and in the heavens. How is that so? 22 is that Psalm, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so you see these waves of darkness that crash on Christ, and we'll revisit that in one more second um, go a little bit deeper with that, but just to set the framework for you so you can start to, yeah, put this in a nice folder that you can keep together. So, so that, those waves of darkness represent that, well, in, in a way, the powers of hell, so that every knee bending at the name of Jesus under the earth. 23, I'd like to propose, is on the earth. Why? Because it's the Lord, he makes me lie down in green pastures. So that green is the color of the earth. If you see the satellite picture of the planet, one of the most remarkable qualities, apart from the blue of the oceans and the blue of the water, is is the green of the land. So the earth represents, that. Uh, the Psalm 23 represents on the earth. But then Psalm 24, and I just think it's fascinating, these psalms hit sequentially. So... I don't believe it's an accident. I believe that there's a a, a spiritual secret here for us. Psalm 24, what does it say? Who shall ascend the mountain of the Lord? So can you see that, those those steps and stages in in that? All right, so let's let's take a look at that then. The, so Psalm Psalm 22, we're gonna, gonna, because today is the the day of the cross, and I, I can feel the tension how can we talk about accessing the throne of grace while Jesus is in darkness? And many times I hear Psalm 22 preached on and this emphasis on Jesus in darkness. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And unfortunately, it, I think it undermines what's truly being revealed in Psalm 22. And so I invite you later today to go and read through this whole psalm to look for exactly what I'm naming for you, but I'm gonna give a basic outline for it right now. So what starts off with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the first wave of darkness that crashes on Christ. But he doesn't stay there. What he does after that, he says, yet you have been faithful to my people through the ages. And so you see him in this narrow experience of darkness, he picks a bigger story and he remembers that you are a God who's faithful. This is, in this way, he rises up above that wave and he gets on top of it. That's that resurrection power, that's that ascension power. So then, after that, then there's another wave of darkness that crashes over him. Yet again, he does the same thing. And this time, he, rather than appealing to the story of the people, He also widens the framework, but he says, okay, this moment right now might be me stuck in darkness. And he's not afraid to say it, which I think this is a, that's a powerful lesson itself. Sometimes we gotta be able to share with somebody, I'm in darkness right now. I'm struggling right now. I'm getting it tight right now. So he says that he's not afraid to own that experience, but he doesn't stay there. He shifts it again, he says, but this time it's different. He says, this time he says, yet you, that you were my God from the time I was in my mother's womb. And he starts listing. So rather than these few hours or these few days, he extends it to the full breadth of his life. 
and all the ways in which he's experienced God's faithfulness. He says, I am not defined by this darkness. I am defined by your love and your faithfulness throughout my whole life, which I have personally experienced. Do you see how powerful? And by doing that, he rises up. He breaks off that victim mentality and he gets up on top of that wave again. He ascends. All right, the final time in Psalm 20, 22, and this also gives a powerful example of the David accessing a fruit, the fruit of a future age. Before I, before I quote this one, I want to suggest oftentimes people say Jesus was quoting David on the cross when he prayed. I actually believe it's the opposite. I believe that David, in the realm of the Spirit, accessed this fruit of a future age and was a witness to the crucifixion. Go back and read the text closely because, the first of all, what Jesus says is, you've surrounded me by a pack of wild dogs. You've torn holes in my hands and my feet. It's said in the first person. Jesus is saying it. Jesus isn't quoting David. David is quoting Jesus. David, 1,000 years before the, before the crucifixion, saw the wounds in Christ's hand, saw the wounds in Christ's feet. From 1,000 years away, he accessed the grace of redemption. This is what I'm talking about, this ascended lifestyle where we access the throne of grace. Everything that we're looking for in the future one day, the Lord's saying, by faith, take a hold of it now. Even another line in Hebrews, which we were looking at Hebrews 4 earlier, says, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's not just the promise of them. It's the substance of them. We're being invited to learn how to live an ascended lifestyle, access the throne room of God, and lay hold of the graces of a future age. And then they're not just for us, they're graces that we can share with others. Okay, so the... Um, so one more thing, in that, in that last, in the biggest wave of darkness crashes, then it's the biggest praise party that Jesus does. He says, yet you dwell in, you inhabit the praises of Israel. And then my favorite line, it says, because you get this impression that Jesus lost sight of the Father. It says, it is, and you do not hide your face from, your, from the afflicted. And it's as if I can see it right there, the father sticks his face through the dark clouds and says, hey, son, here I am. And Jesus is like, dad, I knew it. You know, he's, he's always there. And, but notice the way Jesus didn't accept the darkness as the answer. He, he let the wave crash, but then he reminded himself of a bigger story, the story of his people, his own personal experience, and then the power of worship that God dwells in the praises of Israel. Okay, so... That's And in the praises of Israel, God's presence, this is, uh, I'll say this again and again and again. It's not willpower. It's a will that's empowered by the Holy Spirit. Jesus is able to ascend through those waves by the grace that comes from the throne of God. This is why this ascended lifestyle isn't an option. All right. So now just a few other lines that uh, here's that Jesus answered him. Truly, I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise from Luke, just reminding us of that. And then in Ephesians 2, 6, it says, And God raised up Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So that's the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. So powerful. And then finally, um, the, from the, just another sampling of seeing this ascended lifestyle. Like, I guess for some people I expect this might be the first time you've heard of a quote-unquote ascended lifestyle. And I'd like to say, once you have eyes to see it and ears to hear it, you'll see it all through the scriptures. But here's one more example. It's the book of Revelation, chapter 4, verse 2. And it's actually the end of Revelation, chapter 3, Jesus knocks on the door of the heart and says, Yea, I stand at the door of your heart, and I knock. He who opens to me, I will enter and have a supper with him. And what we learn at the end of chapter 3 is those of us who open our heart for Jesus to enter, he then opens his heart and gives us access to the heavenly realm. In the very next, at the beginning of chapter 4, so chapter 3 ends, chapter 4 
opens and says, Behold, in heaven there was an open door. And then one spoke with a voice like a trumpet. And when it hit my chest, immediately I was taken into the heavenly place. And there was the, there is the throne of there is um, there is a throne in heaven, and and there is one seat on it. And yeah, in heaven there is the throne, and there is one seat on it. Is a line. Uh, so, so what if that's not just for David in one thousand BC? What if it's not just for John when he had his experience of the heavenly? What if that's an experience for you and I? What if Paul's right? What if we are seated in heavenly places? What if the gospel of grace is true? What if there is grace for us to overcome all sin and temptation, be freed from all dimensions of death, and be open to all dimensions of life? I'd like to propose that this is the message of the cross, the finished work of the cross. All right, so that's our look at the Word of God and going a little bit deeper in it. And now we're just going to take a time for some prayer. Yeah. So, Father, thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus. Thank you for your yes to us. And I just invite anyone who's listening to this to just make yourself comfortable, to relax, to allow stress, to allow worry and burdens to fall away. You're in the presence of God. Holy Spirit, thank you that it's your pleasure to fill us. We just say more, Holy Spirit. Increase. Holy Spirit, come and do what you love to do the most, to make Jesus known. Do what you love to do best, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we welcome revelation in our spirits about this ascended lifestyle, the ways in which we can, yeah, lift our hearts up, ways in which we can ascend the mountain of the Lord, ways in which we can lie down in green pasture beside still waters and have our souls refreshed, restored. Come, Holy Spirit. Take us deeper, Holy Spirit. We want to be intimate with the Father. We want to know Jesus. We, we, we desire that living relationship with the living God, Holy Spirit. Yeah, set that seal of fire on us, Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, as we go through um, Thursday of the Lord's Supper and today that the day of the passion and the cross, the death. Be with us to take us, take us deeper, whisper secrets to us about the resurrection already so that we can have that kind of unshakable confidence and boldly approach the throne of God no matter what, no matter how dark a wave may be crashing upon us, that we can remember that the story is bigger, that your love is is stronger and that your light is brighter than any darkness that we might experience. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Okay, as we, as we ease our way out of that, brothers and sisters, uh, once again, we took a look at the, I, I love this marriage between the Word and the Spirit. We looked at the Word, we went deep in the understanding of the Word, but again, we humble ourselves, we know that it takes God to know God, so we spent time with the Spirit but these experiences, this experience of God, this isn't a one-off. This is an invitation to a lifestyle. And that lifestyle, I like to refer to it as living wild. And that's asking the question, rather than asking what, what would Jesus do if Jesus is here, Jesus is risen, Jesus is alive, Jesus is here. So rather than ask what would Jesus do, you can ask, you're free to ask, what is the Lord doing? And if you're... One concrete way to be able to do it is catch yourself at those moments when you're the happiest to be alive, when you feel the most alive. What's the, what, what's the music that you love? What are the places that you love? What are the people that you love? What are the books that you love? And know that He is what you love about everything that you love. But don't believe it because I'm saying it. Ask Him. Test it and verify it for yourself. Let the, let the risen Lord 
um, bless you and speak to you and whisper secrets about how you can overcome darkness and ascend to heavenly places even on the darkest days. All right. So that's the content for today. And we've got an intimate team here. And so um, I'd love to hear, was there a line in there that you felt, that's the Lord speaking to me. That, that's for me. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just making sure that, Evangel, just making sure the, uh, the mute's off. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you, yeah. Okay, um, yeah, that's just when he talks about when he leaves. Yeah. And when he said it was his worst day, it never occurred to me that, I mean, obviously it was his worst day, but I never didn't think that it was his worst day. I was because of the uh, And despite of that, all he had to do was learn to be too hard and ask for help. And yeah. that, that's the very, very last thing. So, yeah, that just really gave me the like, eyes on, on the cross. You know, like, like his throat was how he stood. Yeah. Um, he was able to snatch that soul. It's a very, you know, like minutes or minutes before. So that was, um, yeah, that really spoke to me. Yeah. Being the worst, worst day, you know, sometimes I go through. So, yeah, just turn towards the cross. Just very humbly yell for help. Yeah. And, you know, Evangel, just that it's cool to me the way in which this gives hope for the end, right? That, that yeah, I, I love von Balthazar's dare we hope that all souls would be saved, you know? So there's, there's hope for the end because if the good thief could be saved in that last, those last moments. But could you feel it also speak to like those like our worst days, you know, when we talk about today is the worst day, <laughs> that there's an inbreaking of kingdom that's available right there. Could, could you feel it, yeah, the promise for that as well? Um, well, yeah, it was, it's clear that it's at the end of life. And that's that's the, the biggest hope. Yeah. But also small moments in life when it is our, when we think it is our worst. Yeah, hope. exactly. And I'm speaking, I'm speaking only at a spiritual level. I'm not talking about like physical, physically or any. Yeah. At, at, in our spiritual life, when we feel that, um, you know, when it's dry and it's, um, yeah. you know, when we go through those deserts, uh, just to realize that sometimes you forget to look towards and sometimes you're like kind of embarrassed or you just, you know, you tend to um, not, not have that reach. I mean, I'm talking to myself, not have that reflex to just mm. ask for help and, um, you know, like, like a child. Yeah. You know, sometimes you want to, sometimes I want to deserve salvation. Ah, that's right. Yeah. I want to try to fix this. I want to try to make it a better day. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you know, I um, I think this Lent was really, really, really difficult. Um, this, this few two years, actually, I've had some really tough moments. And I was just reading a book of um, Matthew the Poor. Mm. You know, that, um, so he was talking about when the Lord allows us to live such a desert and, and a tough spiritual life, um, it's, it's sometimes it's his way to teach us that um, it's not our prayer that's going to save us. And it's not that, you know, like when you can't even pray, you can't even yeah, pray. Yeah. So, I, mean, I, was, I, I went through really tough, tough moments. Um, so just that saying when I am crucified, not being able to do anything for myself, you know, and to, mm. to earn my salvation. Um, yeah. Look at him. That, yeah, that's it right there, the gospel of grace, that it's being saved as a gift, not something that we earn. Mari Therese, what do you, so I, I want to give you the freedom to whatever you want to share about, but I'm also curious, and maybe you can do it in two parts then, the ascended lifestyle, is that something that you remember hearing growing up, or does that sound like a new thing? So, but, but feel free if you have some, another place you want to focus, I'm happy for that as well. Um, yeah, the thing where it was sitting for me first of all, and then maybe that will follow on that, but I think, um, when it comes to the head and the heart, mm. my head is 
battling for the unshakable confidence. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, but when I, you know, ascend into the heart or descend into the heart, sorry, mm-hmm. my heart's already gone. Like today, I'm emotional. Like underneath my head, my heart's breaking for the day that it is. Like, I was talking to a friend and I'm like, I don't know why I'm so emotional today. Like, I really just want to cry all day long. Clearly, that's my heart. But my head's like, you know, am I doing enough? Have I, you know, done enough for that? And this has been the best Lent that I've done. But the guilt and the shame is still there and feeling like I'm not enough. I'm just kind of feeling that heaviness of like, am I really dead in? And then sometimes, even when I see your enthusiasm, Brian, <laughs> I'm like, why do I not have that? Like, why? Why am I not on fire like that? And I compare myself and the comparison to faith and joy, and but I know that's all head stuff, you know. So when I'm comparing in my head, I'm like, not living up, you know. It's not measuring up. But if I was to be honest and just feel what I feel in my heart, I'm already gone. I'm already there. It's already bursting. Does mm. that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So it's... I think the ascended lifestyle is getting out of the head. Mm. You know, we're, we're so much in our thoughts, we're so much bound in our minds, ideas of, you know, what's the right way to do it and all the, the you know, me, I resist the rules and the regulations and whatever, <laughs> but it's like a sin and that. Now, that every, now everybody knows. <laughs> um, well, I'm sure I'm not the only one. <laughs> so, um, yeah, well, this journey from the head to the heart, I think it's, I, I grew up in the Western church, so it was mostly the Latin fathers and a Latin um, type of spirituality. I found it very refreshing when I learned about the Eastern church and the Greek fathers, and they talk a lot about the journey from the head to the heart. And I also think it's cool that they say, as the mind descends into the heart, and they're even super practical about it, they say, when you breathe, notice that the breath starts in your nose cold and it descends to your lungs, which is near your heart, and it's warm. They'll talk about moving from this, the coldness of the head to the warmth of the heart. And I was, as a person who grew up in the West where so much was cerebral and intellectual, I was just like, this is refreshing. I want more of this. And, um, of course, one of my favorite quotes from John Paul II is he says, we must learn to breathe with both lungs, the East and the West. We need, we need both. Um, yeah, so just, yeah, so I love your focus on this, Mari, about moving from the head to the heart. And the other thing that you said that I felt wanted to highlight was about the confidence, that, that unshakable confidence. And I didn't mention this when I was given the teaching on confidence, but yeah, there's so many ways in which self-reliance can hide in the shadows and we don't even realize it's present there. So, so where does this stronger faith come from? You know, even like when Jesus says to Peter when he's walking on the water and starts to sink, he says, oh, you of little faith. I used to understand that completely upside down and inside out. I thought Jesus was saying, Peter, try harder to believe more. And the and so consequently, a lot of my self-reliance, you know, I mean, self-reliance, that is taking the fruit from the original sin <laughs> in the beginning. But can you imagine that it could hide that close, that near enemy, trying harder to believe more? And I just feel like there's a lot of confusion in the church where people are trying harder to, to believe more. And so, okay, if it's not that, then what's the alternative? What's the other option? What if Jesus was saying to Peter, Peter, pay attention to your experiences more. Peter, remember this moment where you, where you felt you saw this and you believed and you saw that and then you believed and I did this and you believed. And if we could just open up to what we've already seen. You know, you asked me where my enthusiasm comes from, or maybe you didn't, but you referenced it. <laughs> but this is what I'm so passionate about, because I saw him there, and I felt him there, and I see him here, and I feel him there. 
And this is why I'm so excited about the catch yourself in the act of being generated because cool things happen every day. First of all, I mean, even though I'm fasting now, I love food. So any day that I have a meal, I'm like, wow, I'm generated. Also, I love music. I wake up and I put some prayer music on like, wow, I'm generated. That's him. And what if you just picked three things that you love the most and ask the Lord to show you, are you what I love about this? And, and push it, push the envelope. Like what's the thing that you think, ah, but he doesn't mean this thing. No, challenge him, push it, you know? So um, I already mentioned food and I know food is one of your favorite things, but I was picturing you with your fruit salads and your, and your veggie drinks and all that. Like, Jesus, is that you? And what and staying plugged in is where this, where that comp, that unshakable confidence comes from. Evangel, does that make sense? Rather than try harder to believe more, just be honest about the times. Wow, you showed up there. You showed up there. You show up here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think about. Um, I'll, I'll close with this. Evangel at the monastery in. Um, the, oh, what was the name of that monastery? The Sisters of Bethlehem? In yeah, the Sisters of Bethlehem. The monastery of the Sisters of Bethlehem. Walking in and smelling the incense in that place, I'm like, I'm gone. Ascended lifestyle, right there. <laughs> okay, so bless you guys. Thank you so much for joining me for the Friday. And bless you to all those that will be watching the recording of this. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow for Holy Saturday. And we're going to, as much as we're going to talk about the resurrection, because that's the mystery of Saturday, there's some other deeper mysteries in Saturday that we don't want to miss what's happening as Jesus lays in the tomb. So bless you. We'll see you tomorrow.